Hey guys, all right, we are back with some History Matters, this time 10-Minute History, the Early British Empire short documentary. Early British Empire, though, just off the bat, this is 1497, this is a wrong map, but I'm sure they know that. Uh, early British Empire, God, what, what lands would that be? That would obviously be parts of Canada. I don't think they had the Jamestown colonies yet. Maybe some of the islands, maybe some ports along the coasts of Africa, maybe a port here, but I don't, yeah. They definitely did not have this part of the world yet, but that would, that would come, this would come in the 1800s, late, 1700, uh, late 1700s, 1800s. This I think was 1700s or 1600s, I'm not sure. Hey, we're gonna learn. Let's go ahead and just learn. 1497 and the British Empire didn't exist. Neither no. did Britain. England. Oh. Shit, I just got told. <laughs> I am awful at time. Literally the only date that I know is 878. And that is the battle of... Was Chippenham even in 878 or was it 877? See, I don't even know the thing that I study. <laughs> I know Alfred was king in 870. Oh, fuck. Was it 871 or 872? I, the, what matters is I'm close. <laughs> Ooh, that's embarrassing. England was the largest and most powerful country in the British Isles at this time. Wales, the Isle of Man, and a piece of Ireland called the Pale were firmly under English control. The rest of Ireland was mostly independent, only giving lip service to the English monarchy, and in the north, Scotland remained independent and a close ally of France. King Henry VII of England wished to improve England's trading situation. The English were... That's identical to the real Henry. I, I can see it. ...were not exactly renowned sailors at this point, and so Henry did what everyone else did at the time, hired an Italian, a certain Giovanni <coughs> Cabotto. Cabotto was searching for a northern route to China, but landed in North America, becoming the first European to set foot there, at least since the Vikings had 500 years earlier. Henry VII continued the long tradition of English monarchs and died, before being succeeded by his son Henry VIII. Henry VIII contributed to the expansion of English holdings by incorporating Wales into the Kingdom of England and giving it representation in Parliament. In 1534, Henry split with Rome, creating the Church of England, which would begin the religious divide between England and Ireland. I love their little characters here and how they just hold up signs. And oh, eight years later, he had himself it. declared the King of Ireland, although in reality, this didn't change very much. Henry was succeeded by Edward, and shortly after that came Queen Mary I, a Catholic, who married King Philip II of Spain. One important part of Mary's rule was the beginning of the Irish plantations, which saw lands belonging to Irish laws confiscated and given to the English for settlement. Mary and Philippe never had children, and so after Mary's death in 1558, the crown passed to her sister Elizabeth, because the English Parliament made sure Philippe was ineligible. Elizabeth <laughs> was a devout Protestant, and reinstated many of her father's laws which punished Catholics, much to the anger of Philippe, who saw himself as the defender of Catholicism. Spain held the Netherlands at this point, and the northern part, which had a large Protestant population, was rebelling against Spanish rule. England was more than happy to help undermine Spain's power, and one way the English helped the Dutch was by giving Dutch privateers shelter in English ports. So privateers were essentially pirates who had the protection of a government, and Elizabeth employed many. Spain had a yep. growing colonial empire at this point, and there was a lot of trade, particularly in silver between Spain and its colonies. Privateers would seize this cargo by raiding Spanish ports and ships before taking it back <laughs> to England. The most famous of England's privateers is Sir Francis Drake, who conducted numerous highly profitable raids against the Spanish. He also circumnavigated the globe and even claimed land in what is now California. Beyond privateers, England also sent explorers to the New World, such as Sir Walter Raleigh, who set up a soon-to-be mysteriously abandoned colony at Roanoke Island in North America. Elizabeth we watched a video on that by Lemino. Elizabeth also continued the Irish plantations to shore up the English position there. Exploration and colonisation at this time was almost always reliant on royal patronage in order to get funded. English-Spanish relations were not improved. Taking a pause. What's interesting here about the map of Ireland is the part of Ireland, North Ireland, the part of Ireland that is still under English control, technically, well, British control, if you want to be, I guess, technical, even though the English are still the technical, eh, it's confusing, it's weird. Um, under British control, Northern Ireland is heavily Protestant, but the English crown ruled the Pale, which is where Dublin is, for centuries. 
and that is still heavily Catholic. So it's really interesting that this land that they ruled for a long time never became seeming, uh, or doesn't seem to have become majority Protestant to then stay with the crown after their rebellion in uh, after they secured freedom in the early 1900s. So that's really really interesting little thing that I noticed. That's why England's moves across the Atlantic, since Spain claimed nearly all of the New World, and also losing silver was presumably not much fun for Philippe either. Yeah. Relations worsened when Portugal, England's oldest ally, had a succession crisis which saw Philippe crowned its king. The final straw for Philippe was when Elizabeth had Mary, the Queen of Scots, beheaded in 1587. The reasons for this are complex, but it was essentially because Elizabeth did not want Scotland returning to Catholicism. So Philippe, now pretty fed up, ordered the creation of an armada which was to sail to the Netherlands before invading England. When the armada reached England, several skirmishes occurred, the most famous being the Battle of the Gravelines, where an English victory forced the Spanish fleet to sail around the British Isles in order to return to Spain. Storms, a lack of food and disease killed thousands on the return journey, and this failure pretty much bankrupted Spain. The next year, England chose to counter-attack and launch the English Armada under the command of Sir Francis Drake. The goals of the Armada were to destroy the remaining Spanish ships, stir revolt in Portugal and intercept any Spanish silver. So the English Armada was a complete failure and cost <laughs> the lives of thousands of English sailors and was very expensive. It did, however, guarantee that England would remain independent. Towards the end of her reign, Elizabeth made one last contribution to the empire and founded the East India Company, which was given a monopoly on trade with India. Elizabeth died childless in 1603 and was succeeded by James VI of Scotland, who was crowned James I of England. James's early reign saw the end of the war with Spain and was marked by several attempts to kill him, most notably the gunpowder plot. James contributed to the empire by sponsoring colonial ventures. He sponsored another wave of plantations in Ireland, most notably the Ulster Plantation, which contained many Scottish settlers alongside English ones. James also oversaw the first permanent English settlement in the Americas, the colony at Jamestown. Next was Bermuda, followed by Plymouth, which was famously founded by the Puritans who arrived on the Mayflower. So, Jamestown was founded by the Virginia Company of London, with the goal of making its shareholders a profit. The colony was famously led by John Smith, who maintained good relations with the Native Americans. Smith was forced to return to England after being injured in a gunpowder explosion, and for a time, relations between the English and the Natives remained peaceful. These good relations wouldn't last, and soon the English and Natives were fighting, and after several wars, the English managed to push the Natives out of the area. In order to grow the cash crops on which the colony relied, indentured servants were imported. In this context, indentured servants were people who sold themselves into a form of servitude for a period. This is a good little quick fact. Indentured servants were not slaves. They had more rights than slaves, and more often than not, they chose to go to the Americas. They would often serve between four to seven years. That is a good distinction. That's something that needs to be mentioned. In order to pay because a lot of people that I've seen at least online, um, and not in my comment section, but we also rarely watch videos that are about slavery on this channel. Um, but I've seen comp people like on social media compare indentured servants to slaves, and it's like, no, no, they're not. They are not slaves, not in any way, not even close. They had far more rights. They they chose their uh, their conditions. They chose to work and do whatever the fuck they were, right? Um, so, yeah. For their voyage to the New World. Indentured servants were soon replaced with slaves from Africa since there was no obligation to free them and they were easier to obtain. Yep. Indian raids against the colony and rebellions Political against painting. neglectful rule made it very difficult to make a profit and the colony was turned over to the English crown. There were many reasons for colonial expansion. There was a strong desire to proselytize and convert the natives of the New World, which many believed would civilize them. Some undertook money. extremely expensive voyages of discovery, but the most common reason was money. Ah, Spain and Portugal money. had amassed huge wealth trading with their colonies in China, and England didn't need much convincing. Cash crops such as tobacco and sugar were extremely profitable and even more money could be made on the return voyages via the sale of slaves to the New World, the Atlantic Triangle as it's known. Another reason was security. The money from trade, as well as large overseas populations loyal to the crown, provided extra manpower and money for wars. To support the slave trade, War. England established Yay. forts along the coast of Africa from which they operated, trading goods for gold, ivory, and people. Slaves from Africa were also much easier to obtain. The slave trade was extremely valuable to England slash Britain. I like the distinction there because, of course, when England, England was the one that started colonizing first and then they evolved into Britain. So yeah, it, it, 
Yeah, good good distinction. I like that. It is believed that between 2.5 to 3.5 million slaves were transported from Africa to the New World, New World by English slash British ships. And what's interesting about that? That is just English and British ships. It's not talking about the French or the Spanish. Um, with the sp how heavily involved? Oh you know, yeah, the Spanish would be involved because they own the Caribbean. Um, but I don't think they would use they. I don't think they'd use African slaves for their South American colonies, or at least not as heavily as the English would do for their North American colonies. They would use the locals or descendants of the locals to uh, pretty much be slaves in South America to do mining and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I like that distinction of England and Britain. Very good. On the indentured servants which came from England, Ireland, or Scotland. This was because of the numerous major upheavals across the British Isles, such as the English Civil War, which saw the British Isles briefly become a republic under Oliver Cromwell. The Irish capitalised on a weakened English state and broke away from English rule. Cromwell For a little bit. swiftly put down these rebellions and yeah. seized huge chunks of land and gave it to his veterans. During the Civil War, the colonies generally sided with the monarchy, leading the English Commonwealth to blockade some of them. Cromwell briefly went to war with Spain, who ceded Jamaica, which would form the backbone of England's sugar and slave trades. So long story short, Cromwell died and the monarchy was restored under Charles II, who in terms of empire managed to gain New Amsterdam from the Dutch, which was swiftly renamed to New York. The monarchy would soon find itself in trouble again when Charles's son, James II, converted to Catholicism. Protestant England was none too pleased about no, this, so some lords asked the Dutch William of Orange to become King of England, which he did in 1688. William's ascendancy to the throne caused a major French-supported uprising in Ireland, which was eventually quashed. Scotland also tried its hand at colonisation during the period by founding Nova Scotia in modern-day Canada, which was quickly lost to the French. The most notorious attempt at Scottish Empire building was the founding of the colony at Caledonia in what is now Panama in 1698, which was claimed by Spain. The colony failed due to disease and a Spanish blockade, Welcome. and the English, no English refused to help because they didn't want to provoke war. What makes Caledonia so notable was the cost of its failure, since the venture had cost Scotland almost a fifth of its national wealth and bankrupted the kingdom. Thus, the Scottish and English empires at the turn of the Damn. 18th century looked like this. In return for England financing Scotland's debts, both kingdoms were unified by the 1707 Act of Union which gave birth to Great Britain. Great Britain immediately found itself caught up in numerous European wars. From the War of the Spanish Succession, Britain gained Gibraltar in southern Spain and large swathes of French territory in Canada. Next came the War of the Austrian Succession, which wasn't very important to Empire, except that it paved the way for a much more important war, the Seven Years' War. The Seven Years' War was a global conflict oh which saw British victory and saw the transfer of a great deal of North American territory to Britain from France and Spain. It should be noted here that for many of the... European powers particularly fought over Caribbean sugar islands. These were incredibly valuable as a source of luxury goods as well as a destination for slaves. Yes! These countries, the wars were nothing more than excuses to seize each other's territories. The war also yeah. spread to India, where the British and French were trying to squeeze each other out. The reason for this was that trade with India <laughs> was, was incredibly very lucrative. It focused mainly on textile, spices, and the most important consumer good of all time, tea. So, <laughs> by the beginning of the seven years... Factories were not places where goods were made like today. They were essentially fortified warehouses from which European nations traded from. Nice war, little the fact. East India Company had already established factories along the coastline of India, much of which was controlled by either the Mughal or Maratha empires. The company was largely independent and even had its own military. The company was also deeply involved in Indian politics and it was, was very guy. good at playing Indian lords, called Nawabs, off of each other for British benefit. Robert Clive, also known as Clive of India, led the East India Company forces there. The British won a decisive victory against the Indians at the Battle of Plassey, mostly due to some double dealing. After defeating the French, the Dutch, and later the Mughals, British territory in India looked like this. Bengal was particularly important well, since it had a taxable East India population Company twice the size really of Britain. British. After the wars, the company began to levy heavy taxes against the locals, and Bengal quickly became an extremely important revenue stream for Britain. Robert Clive was for a short period... The main cash crops grown in India were indigo, which was used to make expensive purple dye, poppies, from which opium was extracted for sale to China. Yeah. The governor of Bengal, the British and one like of his to policies sell pop was to force local farmers to, to grow opium, opium for export to China instead of food, which meant that whenever crops failed, large numbers of Bengal... It is believed that during the famine, up to as many as 10 million people died. As a result, the company increased tax collection in order to make up for the lost revenue. 
Oh, God damn, that's, that's cruel. Start. Britain's colonial successes in India were contrasted by its failings in North America. The number of soldiers, tax disputes, and lack of representation in the British Parliament led the 13 colonies to declare their independence. The Americans were led by General George Washington, who would later become the first President of the United States of America. Britain at first was able to win some major victories, but after years of attrition, alongside the French and Spanish aiding the Americans, the British accepted American independence and lost all of this territory. <laughs> The birth of the British Empire was a slow and drawn out process. The reasons for colonial expansion were diverse, ranging from religious calling to the desire for wealth. Colonial failure led Mainly to the wealth. creation of Great Britain, but colonial success meant that warfare now had a global scope and it became increasingly difficult for the rest of the world to stay uninvolved from European politics. I hope you enjoyed this video and thank I definitely enjoyed this video, uh, History Matters. Uh, I think they did a really good job at covering that early British Empire in 10 minutes, that was impressive, I must say. And obviously, as you can tell, I am not a British Empire historian, as I do not really know too much about the specifics here. But that's okay, because we learned. That's the important bit. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. Uh, remember to leave a suggestion down below for what you want to see me react to next, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.